Hi, I'm Lance Henriksen. You're watching Brian Lomax's Movie Talk. Don't turn it off. Batman Forever sees Val Kilmer taking over the title role of Batman and this film is directed by Joel Schumacher replacing Tim Burton from the previous films who remains here as a producer. In the film Batman goes up against Tommy Lee Jones's Two-Face or otherwise known as Harvey Dent and Edward Nigma, otherwise known as the Riddler played here by Jim Carrey. Now after the success of the first Tim Burton Batman film with Jack Nicholson's Joker there was a lot of very high expectations placed on Batman Returns so but when those expectations weren't quite met by the studios they basically wanted to go a different route they wanted to take the franchise in a different direction hence the reason for bringing Joel Schumacher in that different direction is felt right from the opening scene where instead of the, the typical kind of darkness we've gotten from, from the previous two Batman films in which the, the first film opened with a mugging and the second film opened with a child being abandoned. Um, we, we instead get what is essentially a gag between Alfred and Batman uh, in which Alfred asks Batman if he can persuade him to take a sandwich with him and Batman replies I'll get drive through so instantly from the very beginning of the film this new tone is established Schumacher kind of wants to have his cake and eat it he wants to delve into the dark psychological side of, of Batman Bruce Wayne but he also wants the lightness the campiness of the 60s TV series uh, right from the from the opening again we when we see Gotham City we're, we're, we're face with a lot of Dutch angles that's when the camera is kind of ever so slightly slanted um, and again the, the 60s TV series was rife with that um, here it, it feels a little bit misplaced in a 90s big budget Hollywood movie the more darker aspects of Bruce Wayne's psyche is explored in the film through the character of Chase Meridian played by Nicole Kidman now she's a, a psychologist who, who Bruce basically becomes romantically involved with. She basically allows Bruce to, to unload off on her. So he he's able to talk about his childhood and, and really delve into why he is the way he is. And one of the things that was cut from this film uh, was a scene in which we learn that Bruce feels responsible for his parents' death. He blames himself for his parents' death because he, he moaned so much to be taken to the, the theater that night that Actually, he, if, if he hadn't have been moaning for that, then they wouldn't have gone out and they wouldn't have, have met their fate. Um, so that's an interesting angle to take, I think. Um, it's a, it's a, da a much darker angle to take. But as I say, one, it was cut, and two, those aspects in the film, the, the, the part of it that still remains, we have this whole thing with the red book, his father's journal, and he's having these memories, these flashbacks of when he fell into the cave. They don't sit well with the... the the other side of, a, of the film. It's, it's, it's a film of two tones um, and that's never more eloquently displayed than with Jim Carrey's Riddler. This character is beyond camp. He makes Jack Nicholson's Joker quite frankly look a little bit tame um, and it's Jim Carrey in full throttle Jim Carrey mode. Whether you like this film or not will really hinge on whether or not you like Jim Carrey in that mode. I personally can accept it. I enjoy it. I get a bit of a laugh out of it and I think he he suits the character well if you're looking for a modern take on the Frank Gorshin version of the character. Carey for me is the standout of the film. I love what he brings to the role. I, I like his imitation of Bruce Wayne. This guy is essentially Bruce Wayne's stalker and there's one sequence in particular where everything about what Carey is doing is, is imitating Val Kilmer's Bruce Wayne. So he's, he's even put a little mole on, in, on his face in the same place that Bruce Wayne has. He's wearing the same suit. He's wearing the same glasses. He takes the glasses off when Bruce takes them off and puts them back on when Bruce puts them on. And I just love those little nuances um, in, in the way that Carey plays it. Tommy Lee Jones as Two-Face, however, is, is a different story. Now, I will give him kudos for, for going all in with this. He's very committed it feels very much like his character is essentially another Joker. They they basically just it's like they, they told him to go Jack Nicholson on it and he does again full throttle and like I said I give him props for that there isn't a scene in this film where you don't believe that he is he is giving it his his full commitment but the character of Two-Face in the comic books is one of the most tragic figures in Batman's life and that 
tragedy is never really played up and it's, it's never really given a chance to because this is just such a pantomime villain. Now when I was younger I thought that Val Kilmer did an actually pretty decent job as Batman slash Bruce Wayne. However, watching it again recently for this review, I don't really know where I got that opinion from. Maybe it was having seen George Clooney in Batman and Robin and going back and thinking, well, actually, no, Val Kilmer weren't that bad. But I'm looking at his performance in this film and it's pretty dead-eyed. It's a pretty dead-eyed performance. There are times when he's looking at someone and talking to them and it doesn't look like he's looking at them. It looks like he's looking past them. It's, it's a, I don't know, it's, his body language is very strange in this film. Chris O'Donnell is also a new character in this film. He comes in as Dick Grayson, AKA Robin. Um, and I'm not quite as down on him as a lot of people are. He, he was kind of really savaged when this came out, but he is just quite frankly too old. There are scenes in this film just after his parents are killed when he is kind of, taken in by Bruce Wayne and it, th th there's this big point made that actually he, he kind of just went there to save himself a lot of social services things and it's like are you kidding me are you are you telling me that this guy isn't old enough to just go out on his own because the way they're talking about him you'd swear he was like 15 years old and there is no chance in hell that chris o'donnell is going to pass for 15 years old in this film so yeah i just wish they'd have cast a lot younger someone who looks appropriate to the age for this character nicole kidman has probably never looked sexier than in this film however her character for me is just a little bit flat i preferred vicky vale and i definitely preferred michelle Pfeiffer's as catwoman for here she's she's literally just there to look good and be the love interest for Bruce. Beyond that, her character doesn't really make much of an impact on me. Elliot Goldenthal takes over from Danny Elfman on the score and while it's suitably superheroic, uh, it just doesn't have the same kind of impact that Danny Elfman's score had. It's fairly generic if I'm if I'm perfectly honest and there's some really weird sounds throughout it like when we see Batman at the beginning picking up his weapons the things for his utility belt we get these weird metallic noises in the soundtrack and it just I don't know it's just it's too much it's just coupled with the, the camp of the film and all the Dutch angles and the bright colors it's just a little bit too much. The film isn't all bad though. I wouldn't even say it was a bad film. I find it very entertaining. I've watched Batman Forever a number of times, a um, considerable number of times, and I'm still entertained by it. I see all these flaws and I don't know, I just, I kind of push them to one side. I just don't care. I guess it's because I know Batman and Robin's coming, um, but Schumacher does a fairly decent job with this. There, there, sure, there are plenty of things that I would do differently, that I would prefer Burton would have been back on this. But for the most part, I am entertained. I like some of the action sequences. The action sequences in this actually are quite an improvement on some of the ones from Burton's films, um, particularly with the movement in the costume. And Val Kilmer did a lot of his own stunts in the costume, a lot of his own fight sequences. The fight scenes look better because... because Kilmer's doing them and because you can see that there's actually more movement there in the body in the costume One particular sequence where he bursts through a skylight and lands in a water fountain and then does this kind of body flip Over some of two faces men before beating them up is a prime example of just how much the the costume has improved That being said I do still prefer the look of Keaton's costume in the first two Batman films I think the one in this one just it just it feels a little bit too shiny a little bit too clean Batman Forever also sees a change in Batman's vehicles. We get a different Batmobile. Personally, I still prefer the one from Keaton's era, but this one is perfectly uh, enjoyable to watch. Um, but I will say I do prefer the Batwing in this one. It looks a lot sleeker, uh, really good. However, it's just... It's in the film for such a short time and it just feels wasted. It feels like it's there to sell toys. In fact, that's exactly what it's there to do. Um, so we get a bat boat as well. Again, that feels like it's there to sell toys. They literally get about five minutes of screen time, not even that. There are a few elements in this film that might be a little bit scary for, for the younger ones. Uh, one scene in particular is Edward Nigma's final moments. He's been taken out by Batman and his face looks a little bit distorted and he's screaming at the camera. And that scream that he does, 
even now sends a little bit of a shiver down my spine. Uh, it's, it, it, there's something quite spooky just about the way that shot and the way that Carey plays it. Despite the high camp, I do like some of the visuals that Schumacher has given us with this film, um, particularly when Batman jumps from a building and we, we follow him, we track him all the way down, and the camera's kind of zipping under him and over him, and it, it looks really good, it looks cool. Um, I like the way that the circus, circus sequence is shot when uh, Dick Grayson's pair parents are murdered by Two-Face. There's some kind of iconic looking shots in that, like when the, the circus performers, for, for, we, we see it from an aerial shot and they're all kind of forming a circle around the, the bodies of of uh, Grayson's family uh, and that feels like it's ripped out of the comic books and a lot of people will probably say that this film just isn't faithful to the comic books at all but it really does depend on what era you're looking at now this feels to me very much like a 60s comic book um, if you were adapting a 60s comic book this is the kind of film you would get so to say that this film isn't a Batman film at all it doesn't have any bearing on the comic books to me is just it is being a bit of a, a fanboy with regards to 80s comic books onwards. For me, this is a comic book movie, it is a Batman movie, it may not necessarily be the, the iteration of Batman that you like, um, but for me it works on, on many levels, um, not so much on others as I've already pointed out, but overall I'm entertained by it, I like some of the visuals, I think the action in some places is, is an improvement on the previous two. Um, and I do like Jim Carrey as the Riddler, despite the fact that he's really overplaying it. And I would give this film a 7 out of 10. So if you've seen this film, I want to know what you thought about it. And tell me this, who would you like to cast as the Riddler, Edward Nigma, in the new DC Cinematic Universe? Until next time, thanks for watching.